just the time of the year that it's October. It's the place. It's the last place. If you called me up and said, hey, we've got a fire. Let's play a game. You guess where it is. It's the last place I would have guessed that that there would have been a fire because we just don't have evidence of fire in that valley in the past. It's downright shocking that we are dealing with fire in January. Um, that's not the norm. That's not what we should be doing. Normally the fire season you know, usually runs from late May uh, through September, you know, and, and we, and, but we find, we're finding out that there isn't such thing as a fire season anymore. It's kind of all year round. Usually the higher you go up in the forest, the, the later in the spring it takes before it dries out enough to carry a fire. Uh, but the earlier it dries out, the longer the potential fire season. And with with the combination of reduced snowpack and earlier snow melt gives you the potential for a longer fire season. It's the slow burning things, like a slow burning fire, that are hardest to deal with. It's hard to get people's attention focused on a fire that's been going since October. This is not something that clearly is, you know, you don't see flames leaping out of the sky. You don't see huge plumes of smoke. And so those smoldering fires are tough ones to focus on and tough ones. And yet, if you talk to the fire managers, they will tell you they're nervous about it. They're worried about it. But the important point, I think, is that it's not just warming, but it's the much longer fire season that is now allowed due to the warming, which in turn allows for a much longer time period for fuels to dry out. And I think that this recent fire event in Rocky Mountain National Park, the Fern Lake Fire, is sort of a wake-up call for us locally, so that now we're seeing a, a, an example anyway. Again, you know, we don't have enough data points to, to say much uh, in terms of a, a possible trend, but it seems to be an example that's consistent with that pattern of a much longer fire season across the western U.S. The big deal was the fact that it didn't hardly snow at all in early winter, particularly November. November was the month that made that, enabled that month, that fire. It was very, very warm and almost no precipitation. So there were no pre-ground freeze-up snows. Uh, and when it then snows on cold ground, it doesn't wet that ground. And when it snows on, on cold fuels, it doesn't soak into those fuels. <laughs> So it wasn't really moistening anything. It's not fire suppression. It's not other kind of management implications that are driving this change. That wherever we look, you keep coming back to climate, climate, climate. I've been on the fire department here for 30 years. I've been the chief for 14 of those years. So I've been. Uh, a career chief uh, for 12 and a half of those years. We have had uh, usually smaller wildland fires in, in the off season, but, uh, but nothing that has been that major at this point. So that may be a change. The fire started on about mid afternoon, about 1400, 2 o'clock. Uh, the call came in of smoke in Forest Canyon in and around uh, the Fern Lake Trailhead, and it was October 9th. The hotshots on October 6th were on, put on furlough. They were, their season was ended. They ended their fire season with roughly about uh, 1,000 hours of overtime in a six-month period, um, and they had been running and gunning on fire assignments all summer. So we had laid the crew off. We had a, a crew that had just come back. Our module had just come back from a previous fire assignment, and they're on mandatory days off. So. It was the perfect setting for a fire to occur when resources weren't on. Our resources went in with um, assistance from our park uh, law enforcement as well as our trails crew um, to evacuate the public.
And that was the main concern from day one as firefighter and public safety to, and to clear the area. In this particular fire, since it was quite large, uh, it grew uh, fairly rapidly from, uh, at least on December 1st, from being a, what they call a type three management team to a type one management team, to where they had to bring in a lot of expertise from, from outside our area to manage such a large incident, bringing in a lot of resources. When it gets to a type one incident, it's usually because the fire has really grown in, in size and complexity and it's going to take a lot more resources to, to control the fire. Now, when we uh, got to got the call uh, on early morning, December 1st, like 2.30 in the morning or something, to, to respond, the fire had grown. It, it had traveled like three miles in 35 minutes. And because it got into some lighter, flashy fuels, and we had some very strong winds that evening, which pushed it uh, that far, the temperature did get... Uh, very cold for some of the firefighters and even had a little snow conditions that they had to deal with. Normally on uh, wildland fires when the firefighters are housed in tents and, and things as far as their, uh, the ones that are working on the ground, uh, at this fire they had to put them up in hotels. So that was actually a, a lot larger expense uh, cost for the fire. That's something that normally you don't have to worry about during wildland fire season. Those firefighters are people and they need to have a warm meal and they need to have a, a, a good bed in, uh, whether it's in a sleeping bag, in a tent, or in a hotel. And the quality of sleep and the environment that they're in, in the cold, in the wind, um, we weren't set up to put them up into um, the campground. It just doesn't make sense. The Park Service has been on this fire the whole time and they were also using helicopters on and off during that period to try to extinguish the fire. They were able to, at that point, draft out of some lakes. But by the time December came, all of those lakes had froze over. So they no longer had that option. So then we had to use those portable tanks. Now, as the fire chief, I am very concerned about wildland fires. And now, more than ever, uh, just because of the dryness that we've had. We've been in a drought for uh, quite a long time. And, and um, we haven't even seen snow on the ground here in, in so long. So it's. It's a, uh, that is a very concern of how I'm going to protect the properties, but more importantly, I'm going to protect all those lives. Some of those areas up there hadn't had a fire in over 800 years. So that there's a lot of fuels and, and, and heavy duff and everything in, in that area. And if you've ever hiked up into Forest Canyon, it, was, it wasn't really a hike. It was just really climbing around and under all this, all this dead fuel that was laying down in there. So, and all of that is smoldering and burning now. There are very old trees just all over the landscape. L very old, large diameter trees that are laying down on the forest floor. You don't accumulate that biomass and get that kind of forest structure and, and scenario without a long time since fire. And if you kick around in the dirt and try and look for some evidence of charcoal or something, you just don't see it, or at least I haven't seen it. To have a fire begin as late as the Fern Lake fire began and then to continue well into January is very unusual. And it's not something that, that we are prepared to deal with, really. We don't have the structures to deal with that. Right now we're just kind of hoping that fires like that don't uh, flare up. And indeed, the, you know, a fire like that, still smoldering, can indeed flare up. And I don't think we should try and pull too much out of one fire, although I would say that Fern Lake is a really interesting fire and it's a really interesting example because it's late season, it's where it's occurring, it's this high elevation, very wet valley, it's a very narrow valley, so it gets a lot of shading, especially in the, in the winter, fall, spring seasons. It's not only high elevation, but you just don't get a lot of sun in there to dry fuels out. We can't point to fire suppression and land use, et cetera, as driving a change in fuels and a change in fire severity and likelihood or anything like that. It's not a change in fuels. If we have a, a place like Forest Canyon that hasn't had a fire for 800, 1,000 years,
fire suppression since the 1950s is not going to change the fuel structure in this place. The next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years are projected to be more of the same, if not more intense. Historically and nationally, um, fire seasons are getting longer. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist to comment on, on, on why. However, I do know from a boots on the ground perspective that fire seasons are, are getting longer. Um, so if, the, if the, we haven't received any moisture, um, fuels are dry, we have you know, nice days, and lack of moisture, uh, the, all you need is a start. Drought is a, is a reality here in the West. It, it happens. Um, it's a natural part of who we are and what we do here in Colorado and in the West in general. Um, the, the drought that we have seen uh, in 2012, and we're continuing that drought in 2013, uh, is, a, is a quite a serious drought. It's um, one of the larger ones that we've seen. Uh, that doesn't mean it's the largest one that's been out there but it is a, a larger one. And we are quite concerned that um, that the drought we're in right now is being helped along, if you will, by the fact that climate is changing uh, across the United States. It's getting warmer and warmer. It uh, makes for less snow and uh, even drier conditions. So basically, you know, if you were to think about this, you know, we, we've already moved into a dry part of the, of the world and now it's getting drier because of our actions. All other conditions equal, a hotter Colorado is a more vulnerable to wildfire Colorado. It's important to recognize that we're not talking about um, sort of speculation about how dry it is or speculation about how warm it is. Um, we have good records from across the United States, both thermometers and satellite observations, and they all come together and they tell us that um, 2012 was the warmest year that the lower 48 have had since we started taking records. doesn't mean it's the warmest temperature it's ever had, but it's certainly the warmest in the last 150 years or so. Now, that ought to be a wake-up call in itself. In the context of our current uh, quite dry winter in the front range, it's very difficult to predict whether or not that's going to be a severe problem uh, a year down the road because we get most of our uh, snowfall in March and April. And so there are many years where uh, our uh, snowfall up to sometime in February or even early March is way below average and then in just one or two major storms sometimes we go uh, right back up to average. But we don't want to you know, be dependent on that kind of good luck uh, every single year. Uh, we are transitioning from a wet, cooler time to a drier, warmer time. That's what climate change is telling us is going to happen here in Colorado. That transition is occurring right now. And it's during those transitions that you get some strange things happening. And a strange thing that happens during this kind of transition is that all that vegetation that was built up um, and uh, allowed to live basically by the, ex uh, the moisture that, that used to exist um, isn't supportable anymore. And so those trees begin to get stressed, they begin to die. Um, they're, they're basically in the wrong spot now, climatologically speaking, because climate has changed. It's a slow burning thing. And it may be, you know, the, the ground might be burned out from under you before you realize that the fern-like fire is a problem. And, you know, the climate may have changed right out from under us before we realize that we've got a climate change problem.